Reporting in progress. There we go. Okay, I'll kind of start over. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, today we're diving into a topic that's received lots of attention in recent months. Uh, it was really important. We heard from our members that this was vital to discuss, although it wasn't chosen as a topic for a brief report in 2024. Um, a special thank you to our panelists um, for participating in our discussion today. Um, Dr. Mary Kay O'Neill, who's in person, um, Dr. Amanda Tugnin, and Dr. Josh Taylor. Um, as a reminder, the goal for today is not to come away with um, clinical guidelines, but to develop a shared understanding of the implications and evidence for um, GLP-1 receptor agonists and for weight loss. Um, We'll begin with a brief and broad introduction into weight health and GLP-1s, um, which I will go over. Um, and then we'll have our panelists join us for a 20 minute moderated discussion uh, with 10 minutes of open Q&A after that. Um, during the open Q&A, um, please raise your hand um, online and in the room and we'll go in order to uh, make sure that all your questions are answered. Um, then we'll go into a structured um, session where we'll ask individuals um, who have joined us today to share their perspective, um, their questions and concerns with the group for discussion. We do have a significant chunk of time for that, about 50 minutes. Um, I know it will be a rigorous discussion. Um, we'll close with opportunity for public comment as well. Any last um, mentions that people want to make? Um, and this event, as you saw, is being recorded. will be posted on our website um, afterwards for people to, to review. So before we jump into the broad introduction, um, I wanted to share some community agreements um, as we engage in this shared space today. Um, these were some adopted from the Race, Equity, and Justice Initiative from Just Lead Washington, um, whose mission is to grow a sustainable network of community leaders who can effectively and collaboratively work toward equity and justice throughout Washington State. Um, and I thought these a colleague of mine shared this toolkit with me, and I thought these do apply to our, our discussion today. So um, I'll walk you through each of what each of these mean. Um, take space and make space. If you're someone who tends not to speak a lot, um, challenge yourself to contribute by speaking a bit more. And if you tend to speak a lot, make space for others to participate and focus on listening. Um, together, we know a lot. Each of us brings knowledge to our discussion, um, but together we know more than any one of us alone. And shared learning is a practice in humility because we have something to learn from everyone in the room. Um, it also means we have responsibility to share what we know and our questions so that others may learn from us. Um, accept and accept, expect and accept non-closure, excuse me. Um, so we want to solve problems and resolve conflict, but recognizing this is lifelong work. Um, these are processes and awareness rating, raising conversations uh, today and, and other topics we, we often talk about in the brief. Um, they're intended to, to further individual and um, group transformation. And sometimes you may have to revisit conversations to reconcile differences. Um, other cases, things will go left unsaid or unfinished. Um, we hope this through this conversation today, we do come to a shared understanding at the end. Um, and as a reminder, this space is not to sell or contract goods or services with any other attendees, as is with all other free gatherings. Um, so I will jump in and start um, our brief and broad introduction. I am, disclaimer, no means an expert in this topic, um, but this is intended to give us all kind of a baseline understanding of uh, the basics around weight health and GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, we have plenty of people who joined us in the room who are, you know, experts or have personal professional experience with this, and um, we hope that you'll you'll add your perspectives and um, knowledge to this the shared discussion later. Um, to get us started, um, weight health has become an increasingly at the forefront of discussion um, as the average weight of Americans increases. Um, since the 1960s, the percentage of U.S. adults with um, obesity has increased from approximately 11% to over 45%. And most recent CDC, CDC data show over 74% of American adults are experiencing overweight or obesity. Um, individuals' weight is a complex interplay of factors ranging from genetics, psychosocial elements, um, social aspects, and the built natural environment we live in, um, including access to safe outdoor spaces and affordable, healthy food options. 
In addition, um, something really important to highlight is stigma and discrimination towards individuals with overweight or obesity can have profound impact, impacts on mental and physical health. And this bias affects not only access to, but the quality of healthcare that's delivered and offered to them, um, leading to disparities in receiving evidence-based care and sometimes even delaying necessary treatments. Um, almost three in four people who are overweight reported feeling stigmatized by their providers and studies have documented a disparity in evidence-based prevention and treatment when comparing um, them against the general population. Um, I would be remiss if we didn't make a quick note about the way that we measure weight. Um, when it comes to measuring weight, we usually turn to the body mass index or BMI, which I'm sure everyone knows, but is a person's weight in kilograms divided by the square of height in meters. And while this measure is widely used, it does have its limitations. Um, the BMI scale was developed based on primarily white male populations, um, meaning it's less accurate, accurate for people from other backgrounds. Um, especially, it also does not accurately reflect metabolic health and could be unreliable for um, individuals that are pregnant, um, athletes, and the elderly. Uh, it's still widely used as a way to measure weight status, but health professionals should be uh, mindful about the limitations of the scale um, as it was developed based on that limited group of individuals. Um, as for example, it is used um, in the USPSTF, the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommendations on weight loss to prevent obesity related morbidity and mortality in adults. Um, they recommend intensive multi-component behavioral interventions for adults with a BMI greater than 30. These recommendations are currently under review. Um, the last update was made in 2018. Um, as you can see, they are in, they have moved past the draft research plan to their final research plan and are not taking uh, public comment for that research plan anymore. Um, this is important because if they are um, including evidence regarding GLP-1 receptor agonists in this review, um, it, depending on the grade level of their recommendation, it carries implications for payers um, to provide these medications to um, their members as a preventative measure. Um, another important component to discussing weight health um, is nutrition and exercise. Um, there's an overwhelming amount of information about different diets and exercise programs and habits, and not all of that information is informed by evidence, as most people are aware. Um, they eat, but they each promise to be some sort of ultimate solution. Um, this flood of information can be very confusing for people trying to understand how to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Um, in addition, the emphasis on restricting eating to reduce weight can, can also reinforce internalized and externalized stigma and bias against individuals with increased weight. And um, it's really important to be mindful of that as you have conversations with, um, with people who identify as that. Um, this is only one example of a study demonstrating um, what diet and exercise does work in terms of reducing weight. Um, in 2018, a study called Diet Fits looked at over 600 participants who were relatively healthy um, and overweight or obese and were randomized to a healthy low-carbohydrate diet or a healthy low-fat diet for 12 months. Um, they originally restricted their intake and then asked the researchers asked participants to slowly add back in carbs or fat until they reached a level they could maintain for life. Um, but it's also important to note they asked people to eat unrestricted um, fresh vegetables and exercise for the recommended 150 minutes of moderate activity per week. Um, the results really showed that it didn't matter whether the person was on a high, a high, um, a low carbohydrate diet or a low fat diet. Um, what mattered was their ability to adhere to a diet that was um, high in those fruits and vegetables, um, restricted to the level they could on the carbohydrates and fat and that they could maintain for life. Um, and there's other studies that do show this, but there's not one diet that is the answer to losing weight for everyone. Shifting gears a little bit to talk about um, GLP-1s, the glucagon-like peptide receptor agonists. And these medications mimic a hormone released in the GI tract in response to eating, prompting the body to produce more insulin to reduce blood sugar. Um, the hormone medication, the medication mimics also reduces appetite and signals to the brain that the person feels full. Um, one such medication, semaglutide, has garnered attention for its efficacy in supporting weight loss. 
And there are currently three FDA approved semaglutide products. Um, Ozempic, injection, and Rebelsis tablets are approved to lower blood sugar levels in adults with type 2 diabetes, in addition to diet and exercise. Um, it was also approved to reduce the risk of heart attack, stroke, or death in adults um, with type 2 diabetes and known heart disease. Wagovi injection is approved to help adults and children aged 12 and older with obesity or some adults with excess um, overweight who also have weight-related medical problems to lose weight and keep the weight off in addition to diet and exercise again. And on November 8th um, of this year, the FDA approved a new medication for um, chronic weight management called Zepbound or Trizepatide, um, and this also injection for adults with obesity or overweight also having weight-related medical problems um, similar to the way Rigobi is um, approved. Um, the semaglutide treatment effect in people with obesity trials um, initially established the efficacy of semaglutide for people with obesity and it occurred over the course of several years. Um, their collection of clinical trials that explored the utility of once weekly uh, 2.4 milligrams semaglutide administered subcutaneously as a pharmacologic agent for patients with obesity. Um, all SEP trials included diet and exercise interventions, but at various intensities, um, and they evaluated it across different groups, including those with and without diabetes and with and without other comorbidities at various doses. Um, they showed that semaglutide once weekly with various intensity lifestyle changes was superior to placebo or once daily lyriglutide with lifestyle modifications and body weight reduction, other cardiometabolic risk factors. Um, it was associated with a mean weight loss of 14.9 to 17.4 in individual and percent in individuals with overweight or obesity without type 2 diabetes um, at, from baseline to week, week 68. And 69 to 79% of participants achieved at or greater than 10% weight loss with semaglutide um, versus 12 to 27% with the placebo, and 51% to 64% achieved at or greater than 15% weight loss um, versus 5 to 13 with the placebo. Um, they also experienced improvements in cardiometabolic risk factors, including high blood pressure, atherogenic lipids, and benefits on physical function. Um, when thinking about the safety profile of this medication, um, the, a 2023 study um, from JAMA looked at a large healthcare claims database with over 16 million patients, um, and they compared GLP-1 receptor agonists with bupropion naltrexone um, in their adverse events. Um, they did find that there was associated increased risk of pancreatitis, bowel obstruction, and gastroparesis. Um, and exclusion of patients with hyperlipidemia did not change the significant difference between these. Um, while these events are still rare, um, it's important that they should be considered when making decisions on whether to prescribe these medications. Um, and you can see that when compared with bupropion naltrexone, um, pancreatitis, the adjusted risk was 9.09, um, bowel obstruction it was 4.22, and gastroparesis 3.67. Um, when we're looking, talking about these medications, um, it's important to look at what happens when people come off them. Um, while lots of people in the trials achieved um, at or greater than 15% weight loss, while the step one trial extension assessed the effects of semaglutide withdrawal with participants who received 68 weeks of treatment with semaglutide and then were discontinued. Um, from week zero to 68, the mean weight loss was 17.3% compared with 2.0% um, pe with people who are on a placebo. Um, following withdrawal, semaglutide and placebo participants regained 11.6% um, of that weight and 1.9% um, of loss weight, respectively, by week 120, um, resulting in a net loss of about 5.6% for people on semaglutide. Um, cardiometabolic improvements seen from week zero to 68 reverted towards baseline at week 120 as well. Um, so overall, one year after withdrawal of once weekly subcutaneous injection and lifestyle intervention, participants regained about two thirds of their prior weight loss with similar changes in the cardiometabolic variables. And so these findings suggest that ongoing treatment is required to maintain improvements in weight health um, when prescribing semaglutide. 
looking at um, some of the real world studies of use of semaglutide, um, they don't show the exact same optimism as the results of the step trials. Um, in 2020, a study by Weiss on real world weight changes, adherence and discontinuation of the medication among patients with diabetes, initiating GLP-1 receptor agonists in the UK found that only a small minority of individuals achieve 5% weight loss. Um, and that was about 33.4% of participants at 12 months. Um, they concluded that patients on GLP-1 receptor agonists may benefit from increased support in um, adherence to these medications. Um, in 2022, they showed a similar study that was conducted in the U.S. using um, claims data showing that the majority of people that with type 2 diabetes who initiated GLP-1 receptor agonists did not continue the medication, um, with most discontinuing by 24 months, about 70.1% of people. So it's important to keep in mind uh, that a lot of people that start these medications in the real world seem to be uh, discontinuing them within um, a couple of years and that weight regain does occur um, after discontinuation of medication. Another layer to this discussion is cost. Um, in a real world analysis of cost effectiveness of GLP-1 receptor agonists using claims data from 16 million commercially insured individuals, it was found that persistency and adherence was poor to taking these medications. Um, about 32% of people remain persistent at one year and 27% adhere to therapy during um, the post year. And among that adherent subgroup, the average per member annual costs have um, increased from $13,408 to $25,850, which is about a 98% increase um, compared with matched control numbers. Um, so significant costs adds another factor in when we consider the fact that people aren't continuing the medication and that they do regain the weight if they don't continue. All this to say that, um, as you can see, prescriptions for these medications are continuing to rise. And with um, newly approved medications like Zepbound or Tizepatide entering the scene, um, understanding the real world impact um, and patients experiencing these medications becomes increasingly important. So we hope this conversation today can help guide the decisions of clinicians, healthcare systems, and delivery sites, and influence coverage and prescribing considerations moving forward. Um, if you like, if you'd like a full list of our references, which are all here, I know they're kind of in small font, but you can email uh, me at debris at qualityhealth.org to provide that list as well. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Weir to start our moderated discussion. Great job. Thank you for going through all All right, well, welcome. Thanks for being here in person and on the computer, I'm Jenny Weir. I'm the CEO of the Foundation for Healthcare Quality, which is home to a brief collaborative. Love for our three panelists. Um, just spend a couple of minutes introducing yourself and kind of what brought you here today, other than us asking you, all in holding <laughs> you to do this. Um, we'll start with you. Um, okay. okay, thank you. Thanks, Jenny. So I'm Mary Kay O'Neill. I'm a physician. I'm a consultant at Mercer. So one of my major orientations to all this is how to put benefits together, how to make sure um, people that are delivering care to members of our various clients' uh, workforces, you know, including their dependents, um, are getting good care and the right care and that there is true value in using this group of medications. As, as was shared, there's a lot of concern given the a percentage of Americans that uh, just on the surface might qualify for some intervention like this at 74% um, and the annual cost of providing this. And so I think what we're really looking for is to understand value and to help to the best of our ability to match up uh, people who have the capacity to utilize this medication for their best health outcomes and not just sort of throw it at everybody and see what sticks because that's kind of a non-value add and expensive proposition. So happy to be here. Thank you. Let's see, we have Dr. Tasneem. Hi there, I'm, I'm Dr. Tasneem. I don't know, am I echoing? No, I'm okay. Uh, so okay. I'm, I'm working at, uh, I work at Virginia Mason in Federal Way um, and I'm an internist. 
and I started practicing obesity medicine. When the pandemic happened, I had free time and I thought I'll take the boards because this has been a passion of mine for a long time. So I did the boards and it's been three years now since I started uh, obesity medicine and it's been an interesting trajectory. Uh, medicines keep coming really fast at us. Um, and I'm not a business person, so I'm really curious to see what other panelists have to say. I can only talk from the patient's aspect and how, how GLP-1 has helped my patient population. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And Dr. Thaler? Ah, yeah, you got it just right. Hi, so thanks for inviting me. Um, so I... Uh wear a number of hats. So I am a physician scientist faculty member at UW uh, who does basic science research on obesity and sort of the mechanisms involved in, in energy balance and how they're impacted by obesity and how these drugs might affect that. And then I also see patients um, at, in my case, at Harborview Medical Center. So at a county hospital with a largely underserved population um, and, and run both a general endo so I'm an endocrinologist, so I run an endocrinology clinic, but I also run a specific weight uh, disorders clinic that focuses on obesity primarily. And so uh, I, I see the patients in that context. I also pre-cribbed by asking some of my colleagues who work at the Diabetes Institute, um, which is part of the UW system and deals with a, a different kind of pair mix, uh, some of the issues they've confronted with um, the use of the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So I, I'm also interested, uh, so I can present both the science side and the, and the uh, clinical side as well. So thanks. Beautiful, thanks for being here. Well, Dr. Thaler, we'll just kind of start with you since you so generously offered to present to both those sides. How have um, GLP-1 shown up in, in your practice? How has that, um, what has that looked like for you? I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but I think if you just mean kind of what role do they play? Um, what role do they play, yeah. Yeah, so again, I'm I'm both an endocrinologist and a, and a weight doc. So they first started, of course, in the diabetes world, um, beginning all the way back with Bieta, which is hardly used anymore, uh, and have evolved through to the more recent um, and more potent drugs. Uh, and, and so the large scale adoption by patients uh, in my practice has, has been through the diabetes avenue, both because that just started sooner um, and you have a double benefit because you're benefiting blood sugar as well as weight and largely due to coverage, right? Insurance is much more generous to the diabetic population than it is to the, the non-diabetic population when it comes to these medications. And so in my practice, the majority of the patients, even in the weight clinic that receive these drugs are patients that have diabetes. Um, and it's a minority, particularly at Harborview, where, where patients are generally on Medicaid or some form of, of um, low income insurance, uh, that that's the majority of what we see um, in terms of what I can get. And, and it is not for lack of interest on the patient's part. So even, even patient populations that don't have uh, strong healthcare knowledge are still well aware of these medications, well aware of some of the press surrounding them and the effects that they can have, and are very interested and enthusiastic about getting them, and they know people that have them, et cetera. Um, and so there's certainly a lot of clamoring for, for them. So I don't know if that's kind of where you wanted to start, but I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, that's fantastic, thank you. Dr. Tessany, I saw you nod your head. Um, I assume some of what uh, Dr. Thaler said resonated with you. Totally. I, I come from another field. I my 90, more than 90% of my patients are insured patients. So it's just a little different from the hub of you. But I see the same thing. I'm an obesity medicine provider. Most of my patients that are taking GLP ones are patients that have obesity and diabetes. Mm -hmm. The Medicare population that has diabetes and GLP-1 is covered, it's very interesting. They can take the semaglutide for half the year. 
And then six or seven months into taking the GLP-1, they reach the donut hole. And then they have mm. to stop for the next four months. And then Jan comes, I get this barrage of messages to restart them on GLP. So we go through the swing, 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 swing. And that's kind of having the Medicare population. In the, in the patients that have even beautiful insurances, GLP is not covered for obesity. Maybe 20% of my patients have coverage for obesity medicine. And in them, they like the medicine. So it's a little interesting to see the real uh, world uh, statistics. And of course, I'm talking from my experience, right? So obviously I don't have the world experience. So I was really interested in that part of it, but I agree with uh, Dr. Taylor. That's exactly what's happening in my field. Dr. O'Neill, how, how have these conversations appeared in your realm, which is different than what we've seen from yeah. others? Well, you know, as these emerged, and particularly as the formulation for the medication for obesity and not for diabetes, because as everybody's yeah. established, those have been covered for a long time, yeah. but just for the treatment of obesity, um, uh, it was accompanied by something that does not always happen in healthcare, which is an amazing marketing uh, impact of TikTok and other things. So, you know, oftentimes when something new comes about, nobody knows about it, right? And we have to go out there and say, hey, this could really help you. But suddenly everybody was coming in to their employers on the benefit side saying, hey, I want this, I need to lose 20 pounds or whatever because some of the TikTok information was not entirely accurate. Mm. Who knew? So <laughs> we did do a survey recently of our clients and we do these frequently to ask them about hot topics. So we asked about GLP-1 coverage, particularly for obesity. And this is from maybe six, eight weeks ago. And um, so 35% of our employee employers were considering or have moved to having um, coverage for GLP-1s for obesity with a prior authorization to try to make sure that these things are used correctly. 19% um, of our clients are considering a benefit design change around this capability. 7% said oh, anybody can have whatever they want. And 39% said they're not considering it. But I will tell you that the economic climate in my world, it, people are becoming increasingly cost conscious with benefits and whatnot, because there's been a lot of medical inflation lately. Um, and then I think the other thing when something is new um, that is hard to start up is that if you're sitting in the employer's seat, you have to rely on your carrier's management of network performance mm. to know that people, I think people on this call, uh, people interested here would be careful about how they prescribed it, how they supported somebody starting it, how they supported somebody through uh, difficult side effects, how they might support somebody comorbidly through behavioral health issues or, you know, health behaviors, because just because you lose weight, you can be in terrible shape and not overweight if you're sedentary and are eating chips and ice cream. So anyway, so part of the, the, the startup for the employers is to really think about if we're going to make this available to people, we want to use it correctly and well in the most valuable way. And we need to know that that will happen. And that's sometimes prior auth is, is the way people go mm. with that. But there are other programmatic um, health and obesity programs that people can have their uh, employees and dependents engage with that does this more comprehensive look at and on ongoing monitoring for what's happening when people start. So that, that's what we're seeing. <laughs> Interesting statistic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about, obviously there's a huge patient demand here. There's a lot of- right information that has been available, you know, think about famous faces that have <laughs> lost weight, the Sherrod Osborne, we were just talking about this. I feel like I want to say the Kardashians, I don't even know if they're related in any way to this. How have those conversations, um, I'm curious for uh, Dr. Tasneem and Dr. Taylor, what have those conversations been like when the patient has brought up 
um, Ozempic and um, wanting to try a GLP-1. How have you had those conversations when that's happened? Uh, do you want me to go first? Sure. Sorry, I, I called on both of you, but I knew what I'm looking at. So, Dr. Tessing, I, I see Dr. Taylor's uh, microphone is still switched off. So, I said, let me just go first then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, absolutely, yes. Uh, Dr. O'Neill brings up a great point. Everybody comes, even the patient that comes to see me first, is so well informed about the medication. <laughs> I mean, I have not seen this in. They have diabetes, but they don't know anything about their diabetes, but they do know about the obesity and what is happening. And that is just, so it's fascinating to see these group of patients. And apparently there, there are these big uh, Facebook, uh, uh, they belong to these big groups of Facebook and they talk to each other. And of course, some of the information that they bring is just, you know, doesn't make sense at all. But so everybody comes wanting to be on the medication. That is the interesting thing. They have not done any research. They have not done to even see if their insurance will cover it. And when you say, it, as soon as you say the next thing, insurance will not cover it, you should, see, you should see the disappointment in their face. It's kind of heartbreaking to see them because they think that this one thing is going to fix everything. Uh, but to bring up a great point, most of my time is spent on whether I give you a medication or not, this is what you really need to do. You have to fix these A and B, your eating and your uh, activity. And then the medicine is just 10% body weight loss. They don't even, they're not even aware. They think, well, they'll take this medicine and the weight will just melt away. So setting expectations has become a big part of my thing because they lose a little weight and they get stuck and they think the medicine is not working. And I'm like, no, it is doing what it needs to do. Now you need to do it to do something to help it. So yes, that has kind of been my experience is uh, social media has played a big role, but I think patients, you know, though social media has played a big role, they are willing to listen. I mean, they come with an, most of them come with an open mind. And if it's not covered, they ask you what else they can do um, because they are noticing people around them losing weight and they want to lose weight. Uh, so this is a good trend in, in general. What do you think, Dr. Taylor? Yeah, so I, I, I generally agree. Um, of course, in my situation, I get a lot more of the disappointment side because I have to say I completely agree with your idea that you should be on this medication or that this medication may be right for you. But I already know in most cases, especially Medicaid, that the, the chances that it's going to get covered are almost zero. And so it's a big frustration. I, I take a bit of an issue with the idea that, you know, prior authorizations or somehow, you know, deciding which patient population is right and managing side effects is a major barrier to how these things are being used correctly or incorrectly. I really do not think that is a major issue. In fact, if anything, the prior authorization system and the insurance system creates healthcare disparities, massive healthcare disparities. It's the Kardashians that take these drugs because of prior authorizations and insurance coverage. So I, I, it, these drugs are actually fairly simple to use. And as much as I'm a specialist and would love to protect my own interests, the truth is that these are not that complicated medications to start to manage, to deal with side effects, to work on. I mean, it does take some practice. It does take some experience, but it's not rocket science. This is actually fairly straightforward, so much so that, you know, psychiatrists are now beginning to prescribe um, GLP-1 agonists as adjuncts to their um, antipsychotics that cause weight gain and metabolic disease. So, you know, and those are obviously people that are not specialized in medicine, in, in internal medicine. So, I, I think that piece is not the major issue. I also, I want to point out that some of that data that we saw about real world efficacy is largely due to the fact that that is dominated by liraglutide and prior generation GLP-1s that were not nearly as effective. So that data is not particularly informative for the current landscape and especially the landscape to come with the new medications 
Um, I think a lot of the adherence and a lot of the dropouts is due to cost and due, as we haven't mentioned yet, no one's mentioned yet, availability, because there's been lots of shortages of these medications, particularly uh, semaglutide or, um, or Ozempic, Wigovi. Um, and so I personally feel the conversation is a difficult one, not because of the complexities of the drugs, but because of the reality that it's not likely that they're going to be able to get them. I agree. Thank you so much for saying that because the study that was quoted, it was done from uh, Jan 1st of 2021 to 12, December of 2021, and Wegovy was only approved in June of 2021. So clearly Wegovy was not included in that study. So that's the first thing I noticed. I'm like, wait, what, what, what GLP ones are you talking about? Because the real one came right in the middle. So that was not taken into account, right? So thank you so much. I, I thought this, and I, I have the same experience as you. Uh, it's a smaller practice and that's why I said it's just one person's experience. But what I've noticed is it works really well. I think I've had three patients, two of them had pancreatitis that had to stop the medicine and one of them had significant nausea. So we had to cut down on the dose, but so far nobody has gone off of the medicine because of side effects. It, that's been my practice too. Thank you. Well, obviously they'll have to continue. We'll have to continue to study this and publish as the new medications come out November 8th, the most recent medication coming out. I'm curious um, your thoughts on what the landscape will look like in about five years, the policy and payment landscape. Do you think we'll see big changes? Um, Let's, we'll, we'll start with Dr. Tazneen and go through our, our panel. I really hope so. Uh, I heard that Saxenda, though Saxenda only gives you 6% body weight loss, maybe 6.5% body weight loss is actually becoming generic this month, um, which means next, somewhere mid next year, um, hopefully it'll be more affordable, but that's kind of what I heard. Uh, I don't know when semaglutide will do that, but as the affordability becomes uh, more, I, I really see a trend where more and more patients are going to be using GLP-1s to help them lose weight. And somebody brought up an interesting, uh, you know, as we were talking, I think the emphasis was, you know, when you take GLP-1s, you lose weight. And then when you go off of it, you regain weight. And yes, because if you consider obesity as a chronic illness, and that's what we all consider it as, then of course, when you come off of the medicine, the weight is going to go back up. So I'm like, oh, yes, that is a given. Uh, even after weight loss surgery, patients tend to gain weight. And I'm like, why is everybody surprised about that? It's a chronic medical illness that needs to be addressed chronically for the rest of their lives is what I think. So I'm hoping, I'm very positive. I'm hoping that things will get better in the next few years. Yeah, I and I, I'm glad you brought up the point about the staying on the medicines because it's the same for blood pressure, it's the same for cholesterol, it's the same for everything except maybe antibiotics. So why is there an expectation that you lose 20 pounds and suddenly, okay, I don't need a medicine anymore? I mean, clearly it contributed and you are still you, your biology is still the same. And so it's 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 not the expectation should not be that it would be permanent. But anyway, in terms of the landscape. I'm a little worried about the the insurance landscape and the financial landscape because obviously it would bankrupt this country if we put the hundred over a hundred million people that have a BMI over thirty on these sets of meds at a thousand dollars a month. You know, you can do the math; it's not really feasible. Which is why there are these conversations happening, and I understand that part of this is a real problem. The one sort of to me somewhat reassuring part. I'm not so reassured by the going generic. Unfortunately, you know, insulin has been around for a hundred years and is still expensive. So the problem is those are peptides. They're very expensive to make. Um, and it's not the, the feasibility of that for generic companies isn't great. And so it, it's still going to be tricky. Same for rheumatologic drugs that have gone generic. They're still expensive. So, but there is a potential, uh, glimmer of hope here. So 
a number of companies, actually the three major companies, uh, but particularly Lilly and Novo, who are the major makers of, of the two big drugs that we've been talking about, semaglutide and terzepatide, they both have small molecule agonists that are deep into phase two, phase three trials that are likely to come out in the next couple of years. And, and for the non scientists, experts here, a small molecule is not a peptide. It's, a, it's just a chemical compound like any other drug we use. And so it can be taken as a pill and it can be made very cheaply. So there is a decent possibility that because they can manufacture a very cheap pill, uh, the price could come down. That could bring a lot of pressure to drop the prices. Unlike ribelsis, which is a semaglutide pill, but is not very effective and because you can't get enough of a dose because that's still a peptide. So these things have the possibility to really move the field forward. So I am a bit optimistic about that. The one hiccup, Pfizer just last week pulled its drug from production that it's also in that same category, an oral, because they didn't like the, the nausea, the, the gastrointestinal side effects they felt were too much. I'm not sure why, because that's the same with all these drugs. So maybe it was worse than it, than the others, but they decided to kill the program. So that's a little bit worrisome, but the other two have done okay. So that's my only hope is that that will push down the price because I don't see insurance moving very much on this topic so far. Yeah. Dr. O'Neill, well, what's your projection for the next five years? Well, I think um, that it's a nice idea that um, pharma will, find something cheaper for them to manufacture and then they will drop the price. Because I think one of the biggest problems we have here, and it's not just insurance and employers, it's pharma pricing, right? I mean, and employers are on the hook for um, costs for, you know, I mean, and that's just dollars that they need to spend. So they have, that's why they work at putting some controls on these things. I mean, I'm just working with somebody who's got an alpha one antitrypsin deficiency and is clocking in about a million dollar pharmacy claim per month, which is not tenable, but that's all pricing. It's yeah. not anything else, right? So, so I think we have a big pricing problem. And so what I think employers would love to do is to open the doors for all these things if they understood the actuarial impact on their benefits budget. Um, I also, I've been through, you know, being a health plan CMO and things like that. And I will say this the business about prior authorization for a, a emerging treatment, something that's new in the marketplace, um, isn't unusual because people are like, okay, what is this? Do people know how to use it? And even though at University of Washington and, um, Franciscan and federal way, you've got centers and people who are doing things well and carefully. That doesn't mean every provider and every network yeah. is mm -hmm. taking that same clinical approach with their patients. And so what usually happens over three year time frame is that we're able to watch the performance level of the larger group of physicians doing this work to see oh yeah, they're using them correctly. So many things started with prior auth and prior auth had gone away because the community uses things well. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, that's the cycle we're in, but we're in the up, upswing of, you know, everybody trying to figure this thing out clinically, financially, patients are trying to figure out their own personal balance between the side effects and the effect, you know? I mean, I... People don't like to have gastroparesis. I'm, I mean, that is a very unpleasant way to live, but um, you know, maybe there's management for that and those kinds of things. And then the, my other point for me about many kinds of treatment for many conditions, and this is true for these medications or for bariatric surgery or anything else, is that <clears throat> sometimes we forget that eating is a behavior and that it's a behavior that's utilized by people for coping with a number of different things. And I, I even know the bariatric surgery literature when people have had the surgery and weight loss, there's an uptick in non-alcoholic compulsive behaviors. Mm -hmm. Now we have some interesting things going on about 
the impact of this class of medications on people's craving for food. But I just don't think anybody stops being a behavioral being mm -hmm. with issues. And so the other the other concern for me is that people that are being treated for this, that that aspect of their life is also a monitored and addressed. So unintended um, consequences. Yeah, and so that's where you get into, is there a programmatic approach to this to support people with all the aspects of their life that yeah. this impacts? So yeah. it's it's not as simple. <laughs> like Mahmoud has said, you don't just take the pill, the weight melts off and you know, you're running across the daisy field field yeah. for the rest of your life. <laughs> Great point. Well, I'd love to open it up for questions from those in the room or those on the call and slash video for our panelists. Uh, so feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask a question. Mm -hmm. I find that to be easier than to get in the chat. Mm -hmm. I can jump in with a question if we don't yeah. have one in the group, but uh, how how comfortable are we with safety at these doses and over time and, and maybe particularly bringing in the question of people going on and off things? I think we've, from the, the diet literature, it seems clear that people losing a bunch of weight and gaining it and losing it again is a, is a pretty problematic thing. And again, if we're talking about putting we're talking about lowering the threshold essentially for use of these medications beyond what they were initially studied in. Um, how how comfortable are we safety wise for for anybody who wants to jump in there? So I would love to answer actually. So uh, are you familiar with the select trial that was just published a couple weeks ago? So this is a long-term safety study that was done on Ozempic in people at high risk for heart disease with obesity, without mm -hmm. diabetes. And so it was able to look at, and this is a huge study. So there's about 8,800 people per arm. Mm -hmm. So well-powered study. It was able to look at, not only is it able to reduce those cardiac events, which it did, reduce the risk of non-fatal heart attack, but then it was also able to look at, are these medications safe? Do there, are there side effects that we had not intended. And so things like gastroparesis, pancreatitis, were not actually seen to be increased in the exper experimental group. The only thing that was unsurprising is nausea. Mm. So there was more dropout because of GI side effects, but it was a really great study, not just because of that cardiovascular impact, but because it showed that these medications are safe. And that safety profile, things we worry about, like the thyroid cancer and pancreatitis and you know, gallstone formation is common with rapid weight loss, but that's not medication dependent. We see that in bariatric surgery as well. So I love this study for that question. Yes, they're safe. They've also been around, like this class of drugs has been around for a long time. So, yeah. Yeah, and I would add to that, and, and that's great. And thank you for, yeah, pointing that out, that really the safety profile, I mean, there's been some press and there's a lot of lay press and people, oh, I'm like, it destroyed my life and whatever. And that that's a little bit of blowback against the fad, uh, but the, the science doesn't really support that idea. Um, there, the, These effects are quite rare, these side effects, these significant side effects. And the other, to the question of other behavioral things, there's actually growing evidence and clinical trials ongoing that these drugs also reduce alcohol and drug use. So the idea that it, it that it's going to lead to some kind of substitution or or increased uh, obsessive behavior, at least so far, has not played out. I'm not saying that isn't possible, and it's true that there is this interesting signal or unusual, a bit surprising signal in the bariatric surgery population. But um, that has not been the case for the JLPs. If anything, they look like they may have additional use applications in non weight based um, context. So um, I agree that people need to be treated holistically and you can't just sort of throw the medicine at them and let them go. I think there's a lot that needs to be done and, and I understand the, the need to, to regulate. But, but, you know, we do lots of complex medications for lots of complex diseases and we don't, you know, have to consider every aspect of somebody's life in order to say that this is a benefit to them and to show, you know, I mean, how many things do we have that reduce cardiovascular risk by 20% in a 
and an obese population that doesn't have diabetes. I mean, that's remarkable, right? I mean, that's why cardiologists want to start prescribing. I mean, it's, it's truly remarkable. I'm not saying it should be in the water supply, but it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit hard from a purely objective scientific perspective to argue against these meds. And I was a skeptic when, when the meetings, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when I went to meetings, everyone's like, Oh, we've cured obesity, but it, it's not cured, but it's pretty strongly moving in that, you know, controllable treated direction. Yeah, I, I do agree, you know, with the panelists, uh, to, but every, to everybody's point, you know, this, you know, we do, even when a study comes out and it's a robust study and it's all pointing that it's going, that's fantastic. We still have to, uh, you know, nitpick the study and see. And I think, uh, was it, um, so I, I think uh, I, I, there was an article that was attached was the New England Journal of Medicine article about the STEP trial. And the consensus was how that itself, you know, how the, the choice of patients in the STEP trial uh, was, was it so, was the STEP trial so effective because most of the patients that they chose were female patients and highly motivated female patients. And is that why we had such a remarkable, um, you know, study that showed remarkable weight loss? And there's some truth to that and we have to look at it. Uh, but in general, I don't have that white, what the study shows and what I'm saying, I'm seeing just regular patients that have great results with GLP ones. So I'm translating it as it's effective for everybody, at least in my clinic. And I do want to continue giving the same medication as much as I can. Um, but to, to everybody's point, even studies, we have to look into it. Uh, only time will tell us, you know, where this is going. Looks like Tara, you have a question? We can't hear you if you're talking. This is the audio stream. Tara, we still can't hear you. I don't know if there's um Oh, how about now? Oh, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, anyways, I, I was trying to uh, be on with my phone. Anyway, um, hi, everyone. So I'm here for Greg Marchand today. You will pro probably know him. So um, I'm, I'm really happy that this was the one he couldn't attend because um, I'm very, very uh, interested and passionate in this space. So first of all, to all of you physicians, I'd like to bottle you up and bring you to our um, pharmacy benefit manager, our pharmacy consultants, and many doctors that we talk to. <laughs> um, because I think, um, I guess a comment before my question, that there's just still so much misinformation and stigma out there on the treatment for obesity. And so that does bring me to my first question, which is... Um, do you know if there is any work being done in um, your obesity physician groups or, um, I, sorry, I don't know what they're called, but I'm sure there is some, some, some specialty groups to bring more of this education and awareness that you all are talking to, um, to whether it's, it's payers in some spaces, physician groups in others, because there's some endocrinologists, I think, who still aren't supportive in this area. And there's just not enough obesity professionals out there to treat everyone that that needs the support. Um, so that's one, I'll just give my other one so then I can I, I can talk and leave it to you. The other one is the cost is, the, is such a big concern for everyone. I think efficacy, most of us, but, well, we probably still have some work to do, but it's, it's, it's less questioned. Cost is the big issue. Um, do you see opportunities for an off-ramp for individuals that may lose their weight on a GLP-1, but a, be able to transition to a lower cost alternative for maintenance? Um, so thank you for everything. Those are my questions. All right. Dr. Thaler, how about we set with you So um, yeah, that's a hard one. Uh, I don't so I've done a few of these sorts of things talking to, I mean that's not exactly pair groups, but talking to non-patients about 
uh, the situation. But again, I think a lot of the, it's hard to disassociate all the various arguments, but I think most of it comes down to cost. If these things were, you know, $10 a month, I don't think the many objections would be raised because compared to a lot of medications that are in common use, these, these are pretty, pretty clean. You know, they're not perfect. I mean, they have issues that all meds do, but they're pretty clean. So uh, they're being held to a much higher standard, I think, personally, in terms of how they're being thought about. But that's largely, in my opinion, cost driven and reality that, oh, my God, we can't cover everyone. So we have to find a way to put up a barrier, essentially driven. Um, as to swapping meds, um, there's not a lot of direct clinical trial data to look at that. Um, but the biology would suggest that will not work. So there is not much, much reason to believe that in the weight reduced state, which is a state, your body is still fighting to put you back where you were. So if you remove the brakes on that system and you put in brakes that are weaker, there isn't a lot of reason to believe that that wouldn't over time be a you know, that you wouldn't drift up to wherever that other med would have gotten you to begin with. So now that's a whole separate argument that we didn't talk about, which is the relative benefit of these meds versus other options, right? That's a different issue. But, but just putting that issue aside, from a scientific perspective, I don't think you would see better efficacy of the other meds in a weight reduced state. If anything, you'll probably see less efficacy unfortunately and and also uh, tara to you know we know that there well fortunately there's only four medications available for weight loss at this time and each medicine will help you lose only this much weight so if a patient is on wegovy and you can expect 15% weight loss from that and it's kind of shown clinically proven and the patient is on it if you switch that patient from that to like contrave, which is only 6% weight loss, it's just common sense that tells you, right? From 15%, they're going to go down, they're going to go up and then stay at 6%. So it's if, if we had medicines that had the same clinical value, then I think we can we could talk about shifting from one drug to another. At this stage, I don't think we have anything like that. They're all in such different places. Uh, and there's no studies. Uh, Dr. Taylor is absolutely right. Those are great questions, but I don't think we have answers to your questions. Tara, your question made me think about a person making a decision about these GLP-1 drugs versus bariatric surgery versus something else and how those kind of come up, right? How do you make that decision? How do you talk to your doctor about that? How do you talk to your patients about that? Um, Dr. Tassini, would you mind kind of reflecting on that a bit? Sure. Um, so again, there's a change. I mean, weight loss surgery, uh, patients themselves very rarely brought it up. Even when these medications were not available, there's always a fear about weight loss surgeries because they all know this one person or two people that either it didn't work or they had significant side effects. So even when medications were not available, it was a conversation that was driven by me to let them know, hey, you know, this is this could help you. But the, the whole paradigm shifted when Wegovy was available. Now, when patients come, they don't want to do, that is not their first choice at all. They all want to try medications, but they're, they're also clear. They're like, we want to try this first, go this route before we consider weight loss surgery. And with the ZEP bound in the market, and when Monjaro was given the $25 coupon for the whole of last year, quite a lot of patients you know, went to that and there was such be much better weight loss so um, that's kind of been my experience that the people that have been on for two years, patients that have been on medication for two years and for some reason 
don't have any benefit with any medications, they are more than willing to talk about weight loss surgery as opposed to when they come in first to see you. What do you think, Dr. Taylor? Is that your experience too? Yeah, I would say it's pretty similar. I don't need to belabor the point, but bariatric surgery is a big deal. And even though it's changed a lot and now we do sleeves more than we do Ruin Wise, so a much less invasive surgery, it's still a big deal. And it's a lifelong, generally speaking, you don't reverse them. It's, it's never the patient's preference. The one sad reality is insurance tends to cover it much better then it covers weight loss meds. And so sometimes we have that conversation because it's like, well, you can't do this, but you can do this, which is from a medical perspective, a horrible reason to be having, you know, a, 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 a therapeutic decision-making conversation. That's not the, should not be the basis of that conversation, even though bariatric surgery is very effective. Don't get me wrong, but it, you know, ZEP bound is 20 to 25% weight loss. You're getting pretty close to what a sleep does. So why would you do surgery if you can do that? So, but anyway, I see there's another question. It looks like Sarah E, do you have a question? Yeah. Hi, um, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, um, I just um, wanted to, I'm here more as a um, individual than a representative of the Washington State Department of Health. That's just that's on my Zoom here, but um, I am, um, wanted to give a little bit of a patient perspective and ask a couple of questions of the providers. Um, I guess my observations um, as someone who um, kind of has been in this realm as a patient, but also um, professionally in the realm of, of um, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes prevention, um, it seems as though these medications really point to there being some underlying um, or multiple underlying uh, systems that really do make people who are grappling with weight um, different um, in some way from, from people who don't. And I know these are incredibly complex systems and environment plays a huge role, but I just wonder about if there's a way that um, seeing the efficacy of these medications um, has changed the way that you regard patients who um, present with excess weight, um, or if there's something you'd love your your colleagues to know or your fellow <laughs> um, providers to know about just what what the implications of this seem to be for really taking away some of the stigma associated with um, with excess weight. I can take that if you want. Um, so you're basically putting into words the idea that obesity is a disease, which is a very controversial, but very well supported statement based on the science. And that is by definition, a disease means that there is an underlying process that goes beyond things that are you know, that are under one's control, right? And in particular, obesity is at least 50%, if not more, genetically inherited, um, which is, again, very well established. Uh, it is a complex genetic disease, so there's no simple one gene kind of answer here. Um, and But those combination of all those little changes in the genome make somebody susceptible in the right environment, so absolutely environment is important, to manifest this particular chronic disease, which is excess weight, which again, brings with it all kinds of other, other problems. Do, do I wish that my colleagues saw it that way? Absolutely. Um, and it is not a universally held view and it's, you know, it's complicated and obviously obesity stigma is a, is a reality and it, or weight stigma is a reality and it's a problem. And just because somebody has, uh, a genetic predisposition or, or, or is in an environment that's conducive should not reflect at all on who they are as a person or on what they're capable of or on, or how their life should go. Right. So the stigma side of it is, is abhorrent and also unhelpful, right. Uh, on every level it's bad. So, um, but that does not mean that treating obesity as a disease is playing into the stigma is saying, oh, well, you have some problem that needs fixing. It's saying 
this is a, a condition that has large elements that are not under your control that we can help. We have modern tools to benefit that can lead you to live a longer, healthier life to do all the things you want to do. And so um, including, right, that these benefits on cardiovascular risk, some of which are weight independent. So it, it's really you know, trying to frame it in a different way. And, and yeah, I wish that were the commonly held belief. It is among many, but not among all. Oh, wait, one other thing I will say, just from a science perspective, there has been a lot of interest in trying to figure out if the, the Incretin drugs, the GLP-1s and the new ones that are combo drugs, the terzepatide, which is GLP-GIP combo drug, these classes of drugs why are they so, is the implication that they're so effective, does that mean that that GLP system in patients that have overweight or obesity, are they defective in those systems, right? Normally when we do a drug, we do it because we assume the system is broken in some way in that system. And so we try to fix it there. And, and these drugs kind of came out of nowhere in a lot of ways. They weren't really based on that. They weren't based on this idea that we have found through studies that obese, that people who are prone to weight gain have low GLP or have low GLP signaling. That's not really the case. But there's recent data that I actually just saw last month looking at these ginormous genomic studies where they're taking millions of patients and looking for tiny changes, that there are some hits in the GLP and GIP systems. And so maybe there is some difference in those patients, but that is fresh off the press, you know, that is too fresh to know if that's true. So far, it just seems they're effective. They can sort of overcome all those other genetic things that aren't necessarily in that system. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out, that there's maybe even a biological basis for these meds. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'd love to hear from anyone else. I think that was beautifully said. I don't have anything more to add. Agree. <laughs> Oh, Emily, go. Yeah, just okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emily Nudelman. I'm one of the staff members at the Brain Collaborative. And just listening to the panelists speak and kind of comments made in the room, some things I just kind of jotted down were, I, I'm thinking about equity, and we're hearing how it's hard to access these medications mm -hmm. because maybe they are not at the pharmacy. The affordability and, and the cost of even getting it so then your insurance company can cover it. Mm -hmm. um, I heard a little bit about health literacy and how people think they know something <laughs> it's like it's out there and um that's a whole other thing about media a little bit but then also we were here i heard this the medications people think are this golden magic pill but rather it's exercise and healthy eating is really a huge part of this which in our country is a privilege to be able mm -hmm. to exercise safely and to eat appropriately so I'm, I'm kind of taking all this in and i'm curious to hear a little more about about this equity piece in your roles and how um, can there be a collective effort to address this with, with when prescribing GLPs or kind of the work that you're seeing. Um, I think, it, again, the example that I was hearing was, okay, working on the, the cost of the medication is, is a possible area, but I'm just kind of curious in your roles what, what other areas do we need to kind of look into specifically within the GLP blood space? The big top, a big question, I'm saying, but well, I, I would like, I, to ask the other Emily, yeah. <laughs> not based on the GLP ones, but Emily was very instrumental in the state of Washington in looking at treatment for hepatitis mm -hmm. C that Medicaid originally and some others were like, we can't do this, it's mm -hmm. too expensive. I mean, and so what's the deal with figuring out value, figuring out how to get people on board to understand doing the right thing for people over time? Because Health is um, not just a personal value, it's a community and an employer value as well, right? So how do you weave your way through that? So I don't know, I'm putting Emily Transu on the spot because she ran that discussion about hepatitis C drugs that came out yeah. as being unbelievably effective for something we couldn't treat before mm -hmm. at a very pretty price tag. Yeah, I have to say I have been <laughs> I've been sitting here you know, thinking about the hepatitis C experience, among other things, because it was, you know, in a way you look back and it seems like a, a shot over the bow uh, <laughs> yeah. toward 
toward what this would then become and, and who knows what comes next. But um, I, I think it, I don't think there are any clear answers. I think the pricing piece is one of them, you know, and the decision with hepatitis C, the, the decisions with hepatitis C, I think were driven through a bunch of different routes. One of them was through legal challenges to decisions that were made. But a lot of it was through sort of saying, okay, here we have this thing that is so expensive that as, as someone on the line said, it, it, it would bankrupt the entire system if we gave it right now, you know, if we paid it at current prices to everyone who could benefit from it. Um, so what do we do? Uh, you know, and, and I think the um, one of the approaches to that was say, okay, who right now it's unbelievably expensive. Let's figure out who really, really needs it right now and can't can't wait and can't do without it. And then over time, as we have more experience and as prices hopefully come down, I agree with you. Prices don't just organically come down. Yeah, they do not. And I think there there's a big regulatory opportunity in mm -hmm. that. I think there are, um, I think we are aware of a lot of factors in, in the US healthcare system that maintain um, extraordinarily high drug prices at a, in ways that are not proportionate to development costs, et cetera. But so, right. you know, so there's a piece of tr treat the people who need it most right now. And, um, and as costs come down, treatment opportunities go up. I would say that that's probably the biggest lesson from, from hepatitis C. Also thinking through equity, equity. and other things yeah. in that in that approach to um, who, who gets it first, mm -hmm. trying not to have it be. The Kardashians. The Kardashians, yeah. yeah. Get their hepatitis C treated first. So I wonder how much obesity bias plays into that too, because hepatitis is obviously not something you can control. Once you have it, you can't will yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. But there's still this perception that people can if they have enough self-control and enough effort, they can magically not be obese, which is not, I'm not saying that's true in any way, shape or form. As an obesity provider, that would be irresponsible. Um, but I think that that plays into some of these decisions um, because people still have that bias, even though three quarters of the country are affected by this. The majority, yeah. The majority of people, regardless of socioeconomic status and education and any of those things. So um, unt I think until we're able to accept obesity as a chronic disease that is not in, in our control, um, the equity piece is going to be very difficult. Great point. Can I just jump in and say that I would love it. I mean, as much as I would love to give it to anyone who walks in my door who meets criteria, I would love it if they applied a who needs it the most uh, prior off process, but that is not what happens. So it is not the people who are on Medicaid with a BMI of 50 who are, you know, in an electric wheelchair who are, you know, by all measures of and have many, many comorbidities who by all measures of predicted mortality have very high numbers. They are not the ones who get it. They are not. They are, it is the people with the good insurance who maybe aren't, you know, who maybe have a BMI over 30, but don't necessarily you know, have some immediate risk associated with that, that are, you know, if they happen to have coverage, they're the ones who get it. So I would be, you know, as much as I would like it for everyone, I agree that if you could roll it out across sort of the way we did with vaccines, right? The old, the elderly, most susceptible got them first, or, you know, I, I feel like that would be fine, but that's not, there's no movement to that at all. And that would, in my mind the healthcare disparity question which is where this started that tends to be the population that needs it the most they're the most affected by it um for sure non-caucasians are the most affected both at the level of of prevalence of obesity and overweight and complications that arise from it both of those things so that would help actually move the needle toward the populations that you know to toward addressing some of the, the social determinants and the healthcare disparities. Obviously, there's a lot of other pieces to this in terms of healthy eating and, and all the other stuff that I agree it's easy to say when you have the privilege to say it but or to address it. But 
I, I think that would help. And I would love if somebody walked out of the room and talked to somebody with power to say, hey, maybe we should have tried this metric that we did with hep C. I, I think that's a great idea. Looks like we have a question from Tara, and then we'll go to Sarah Hughes. So Tara, we'll start with you. Great, thanks. Me again. So this has really lit something up in me. Um, because at least in the employer space, and I think it would also impact Medicare and, and Medicare too. So a lot of our prior authorizations go off the manufacturer's drug label. Some employers, large employers that can adjust this are making different modifications to BMI. One might be 35 and above, 37 and a half is another one. So trying to start triaging to, to, to some of the most needed, but some of the most needed may not show up in a 38 BMI. So is it just too comp is the disease of obesity just too complicated to be able to prioritize others? Or would there be other um, genetic identifiers or other comorbidities that kind of rise up to um, priority? Because I think I think some of the challenges with these bigger groups is what we talked about earlier. So what do we have? 40 to 70% of our population that qualifies for these off of the label. Um, and it's so massive. So is there anything other than BMI that cover payers could use to start prioritizing? I think that might be very welcome um, in, in the space. Okay, Kazni, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there has been, for example, a set of criteria that have evolved over time over bariatric surgery that might be something people could look back to that included some of those components. I'll let others who are yeah. jump in. No, I think I, this is where evidence-based medicine will play a big role. Um, we clearly know now that, you know, GLP-1s do help with cardio, cardiovascular morbidity and diabetes, right? Those two have to happen. Uh, if, you, if you have a BMI and if you have one of these qualifications, you should automatically get GLP-1s. At least that's where we'd start. And the second thing is the clearly 40 and above BMI, all patients 40 and above BMI should qualify for GLP-1s. That is the minimum we should start with. But, but to your point then, you know, somebody asked this beautiful question about equity uh, and, and it is, it, 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 as physicians, we are asked to practice equitably, but we can't. In the real world, you're not able to. Equitable is from the beginning when you see the patient, how you treat the patient to how you, what prescriptions you give the patient. We are not able to do that. We could, you know, we could treat the patient equitably. We can, you know, we, we don't have to have biases. We can put aside, put aside our biases, but in the end, how we prescribe <laughs> is so different. It all depends on who can afford what. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, it's, so the practice of equitability, it has to be from the get-go, from the time you see the patient to the time the patient goes, and that is not what's happening in the real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with exactly with what Dr. Tasneem said, both on the equity space and, you know, I mean, you have to sit down and be and, and go through the evidence to look at which comorbidities you want to cover and which you don't, whatever. But I would agree that certainly the evidence base for the cardiovascular, for the me cardiometabolic uh, piece of this is pretty well established, particularly for this drug class. And, and that kind of follows, uh, you know, as was said, the, the kind of basic parameters for bariatric surgery approval, which is a BMI over 40 and a BMI over 35 with comorbidities and typically the, the cardiometabolic comorbidities. So it's a pretty similar metric um, or rubric, whatever. You might expand that a little bit. I, I, you know, again, if you're in a closed room with a bunch of experts, you could come up with some other things too. But I think that's a reasonable place to start. Well, that sounds good. I mean, I agree. And and I, I have spoken to a, a, well, out the company, but uh, one of the pharmaceutical um, directors for insurance company for a large employer in the, in the state, because their costs have really gotten out of control with Wagobi. And so his, he came to me to ask, how, what do we do about this? Because they wanted to adhere to the FDA guidelines. But when you include all those people, especially someone with a BMI between 27 and 30 with comorbidities, that person with BMI 27 may actually benefit from some of the medications that produce lower weight loss. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, we talked about ways to reduce the costs and, and certainly some people respond well to those. So one of the things that could be, you know, a stair-step approach would be you try diet and lifestyle, and then you try these other medications that are less um, expensive, and then you move on to, okay, that didn't work. Now we do the GLP ones. And, and that could also include, okay, that didn't work. Now let's add on bariatric surgery. Um, and there could be steps along the way where you can skip one of those steps. So it could be, you know, your BMI is 50 and you have diabetes. That patient, unfortunately, likely needs surgery. And so that they might, you know, skip to the top of the list. So kind of having that stair step approach, but being able to kind of automatically qualify. I mean, that would be it in my world. That's how it would work. <laughs> Sounds similar to one of bundled payments. That yeah. Free and free and free. <laughs> Uh, we do this for a lot of other medications. You know, I, I, it's not that hard. I mean, in Medicare, patients that have osteoporosis, right? It's there's clear guidelines. You start with bisphosphonates, and if bisphosphonates don't work, you have to say why it's not working. You you have to clearly document, and if that doesn't work, you go to the next step. We can do the same thing with obesity. Uh, it's just that somebody has to be willing to listen to us to make these changes. At this time, it's up in the air, right? And, and sadly, even those cheap cheap medicines like fentermine and topiramate, yeah. which are the obvious ones that you would start with, they're not covered either. I, so, I mean, it's pathetic. You know, yeah. fenter, fentermine with, with a coupon is, with a coupon that's a free coupon, essentially, that's not drug company related coupon is eight to $10 a month at the dose that you, at the max dose. So, and it's not covered by almost any insurance. So they just exclude weight as a category. It doesn't matter what the approach is. So I agree, you could go stepwise, like we do with diabetes frequently. You start with metformin, blah, blah, blah. And, and but it's just not done that way. The whole category is just cut out from most plans. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. I would say, I would say that's being revisited with the onset of these new medications, I think. Because historically it was like, well, none of this works that well. So what am I doing? <laughs> but so I, hope, I think this, these guys might be brought along in this new look at the benefit structure. So I'll, I'll, so one, we'll answer a chat question and then we'll go to Sarah Eve and then Kat will. Um, so the question in the chat, what about the impact on pediatric patients getting medications? Mm -hmm. Have any studies been done specifically on the population? What are you seeing in a clinic? 12 years old is very young developmentally to make these decisions. Dr. Baylor. I don't, Dr. Tasneem, do you have pediatric? You probably don't either. But I do have... Uh, you know, learning disability patients, Down syndrome patients. I'm so sorry, I got up to put on the light, so I missed the question. <laughs> I'm so sorry. What was the question? It's about these me these meds in the pediatric population. No, pediatric. Yeah, age and developmental. Mm -hmm. I, I do have, I have actually about, I can only talk from my experience, I have about four patients that are, that have, they're not pediatrics, they're 21 to actually 65 that have developmental disabilities and learning disabilities. And, uh, but the, the patients I am seeing have amazingly supportive family members. Like we are talking about, please tell me what to do. I'm going to help this person. And again, this is because of social media and the hype about obesity medicines and how it's helping finally they're all patients and their families are getting involved. And I have to say, none of them are on GLP-1, but all of, almost all of them have had at least 30 to 40, some of them 50 pounds weight loss, just with behavioral changes, intense talking, motivational interview, and the simple medicines like fentramine, topiramate, and uh, Contrave has made amazing changes in these patients. Can they go further with GLP? Yeah, they could. At least for now, yes, I have had good experience. Yeah, I can't speak much to pediatrics. I'm not a pediatrician. I agree it's a very tricky issue, right? Especially if you're talking about lifelong medication, right? Which is kind of what we're thinking here. And if you think it's a disease and it's just manifesting at a younger age in that population, that particular patient. 
So I agree. It's a very tricky issue. I do not, uh, you know, I, I, I have sympathy for the patient and family and the provider to try to make that determination, but I don't have personal experience to say how, how you should decide who, I think there's some logic that you could use that's similar to what we already talked about, about a, a person's, a, a child's trajectory that's looking, you know, there, there are pathways you can see that you can project forward that this, this child or adolescent is going to run into trouble, you know, on the current level that they're going at, they're going to end up with health issues or diabetes or what have you at a very young age, which is going to have a dramatic effect on their life. And so you might be able to identify those patients and focus on them. But, but again, I'm not a pediatrician, so I, I can't say that from personal experience. Thank you. I'm going to move over to Sarah E. Hi. So I just um, wanted to uh, bring in, again, the sort of patient perspective. So one aspect is, um, I think, with diabetes, where there's that stepwise treatment, and it's very transparent, like this is how it goes. This is what we do with everyone, unless there's some exception. I feel like that communication could be really helpful because there may be people who realize benefits that are not necessarily, that are auxiliary to weight, that is improvement in quality of life, improve, improvement in fitness, um, improvement of other biomarkers that you could see with other medications or treatments, not just these um, most expensive ones. And then also realizing that not every, um, not all of the people who have a BMI over 30 are interested necessarily in this treatment. So they may, you know, I mean, just as with any other chronic condition, people are in different uh, parts of understanding, accepting, wanting to do the things that are needed to treat. So I think keeping that in mind, it's not, um, I think there are ways to assess patient readiness, to assess acceptability of treatments, all of those things that um, that would mean that not every, you know, kind of every single patient who qualified for this medication would, would necessarily want to take it. Great point. I 100% agree. And I will say, and I think Dr. Tesling would probably agree, we, you know, this discussion is being focused on GLP-1. That's sort of the title of the thing. And so it makes it look like that's all we do is hand that out when the person walks through the door. And that's not the case. So there's a lot. Now, I'm a referral person, as as is she. So, so these are patients that are already considering weight loss. So we're not at the stage of, stage of the primary care provider saying, hey, have you thought about this? And, you know, where are you in the process? So we're seeing maybe a little bit of a different slice of people, but we certainly talk about lifestyle. We talk about the other benefits that come that have nothing to do with weight. Um, and we also talk about, you know, when it comes to medicines, uh, the other options. And, and as a person who works at Harborview, 99% of my patients, if they're on a medication, mo many are not, but if they are, it's fentramine topiramate. It is not a GLP. Believe me, that is not by choice, but that is the reality. So I'm all for, and, and many are quite successful. So I, I, I don't want to badmouth the alternatives. I think that's why I think stepwise is not totally wrong. I think there's some merit to that. I, I completely agree. And I have, most of my patients have insurance, but I am in the same boat. Uh, they just have insurance but GLP is not covered. So uh, at least 85, 90% of my patients are on fentramine and Contrave. That is, and yes, thank you for saying that. Yeah, we just don't, I mean, we obviously we talk to them and uh, behavioral changes is one of the most important pillars. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on that and this is just added on. But, uh, you know, to, uh, to Sarah's point, um, not all, I mean, there are about five to 10% of patients who, even after all that conversation, they don't want a medicine. They want to try it on their own. And we are more than willing to hold their hands. They just want accountability. They tell you up front. We give them all their options and they say, this is what I wanted. And I'm like, yeah, go for it. That is the best option in my opinion. So yes, we support them 100% on that. Pat Wolf, it looks like you're next. Do you have a question? 
Um, yes, so hi everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. So, um, and full disclosure, I do work for Novo Nordisk, which is one of the manufacturers um, of the products we're discussing today. However, I am a pharmacist by background, so sit on the medical side of our company. And prior to joining Novo just over a year ago, worked for 12 years in population health. So very, um, very, very much resonate the messages around how you identify and risk stratify and, and the concepts that are being discussed. Um, a couple of comments, which will then lead to my question. Um, the first is around um, the, um, the Boeing question around identifying patients most eligible or at greatest uh, potential benefit. And so the, the data does show us around the 200 obesity related comorbidities um, due to the free fatty acid accumulation and breakdown that leads to predominantly um, first presentations around diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and dyslipidemia. So that's often, you know, I think doctors, Thaler and Kazneem mentioned the patients that can often benefit. Though keeping in mind, um, when I think back to my, my prior life, being able to identify patients who um, are experiencing um, things such as joint pain and eligible for knee and hip replacement, when we were going down the path of, of risk stratification and identification within our commercial population, those were the types of approaches we would work with our benefits consultants in order to develop a, a more robust program that um, really engage patients in holistic uh, management. Um, the other piece that um, I wanted to mention is not only the stigma related to treatment of obesity, but patients have their own stigma around seeking of help. The evidence also further supports that patients often attempt up to seven times of self weight loss, meaning a concentrated effort to decrease caloric consumption and increase activity level prior to talking to their provider um, about needing an intervention. So when we think about uh, the holistic approach to a patient and a patient's motivation, keeping, keeping that fact in mind. Um, and then additionally, from a pediatric perspective, um, often the obesity is a generational um, effect. And some of the providers that I've spoken to at Seattle Children's um, have mentioned seeing an earlier onset of hypertension and dyslipidemia in patients as young as 20. Um, so thinking about the, you know, what are the complication rates and the morbidity and mortality of the patients that, that have those um, diagnoses much earlier. Uh, that's one thing I neglected to mention is I do have the privilege of meeting with health plans, health systems, and healthcare decision makers across Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Alaska. So have a whole variety of different, um, different approaches that people report and approach um, on that fact, which leads to the question, um, and some of the data that, that was presented, the adherence evaluation process was one question I did have in mind. When, when I meet with many of these health plans, health systems, they report uh, some of their adherence data is lacking and the fact of patients leaving employment or losing employment and um, discontinuing medication, as Dr. Tasneem mentioned, due to cost. So would love to understand a little further the approach to um, adherence, monitoring, and management, and, and if there was an evaluation, even a patient evaluation of discontinuation rates um, and reason, if that's attributable to cost or ability to access the medications or uh, some other reason entirely, uh, because I think it's um, it does limit the conversation a little when, when stating that the adherence to GLPs is less um, versus other some of the other medications alone. So um, would, would love to understand further on that process. And thank you. I can jump in a little bit on that. So, uh, I, you know, I don't collect systematically adherence data in my own populations. And what I, what I can tell you, again, it's probably anecdotal. And this is probably more from the diabetes side because I have more patients on those meds. First of all, that adherence data was not in comparison to other medications, it was in a vacuum, right? So it's whatever the numbers are. The adherence to fentramine, topiramate, things like that is not much better, if potentially worse, because the list of side effects is actually longer. Um, it, they're cheaper, so cost is rarely the reason in those cases. Um, for me, uh, there are definitely a, a, a sector of patients that cannot tolerate the side effects, regardless of how slowly you go, 
how gentle you are, they just can't. That's not a huge number, but it is, it's, it's a real number. That doesn't mean we shouldn't give people the meds. I mean, there, every med has a potential side effect and you just stop it and move on if that's what happens. Um, and so there's definitely a chunk of people for whom that's true. But of the ones that are not in that case, most are adherent. Uh, but again, the shortages have driven some people nuts to the points where they're like, I just don't want to deal with the shortages anymore. I can't go on and off and on and off. I gain weight, I lose weight, I gain weight, I, I can't deal with this. So they prefer just not to deal with that. So that's one very current recent reason. And then of course, cost is, is the other big one, I would say, um, beyond others. I mean, yeah, side effects is super, you know, other than the ones that can't tolerate it up front, the like late on side effects, like gastroparesis or something like that, that's been very, very, very rare for me. It's the same way for me. Uh, until I think, was it June of this year? Uh, patients are, they really want to be on this drug. Until June of this year, I was sending most of my patients that was not covered, that the medicines was not covered we were sending them to a pharmacy in Canada to get the medications. And there was, I was sending 30, 40 prescriptions a month to Canada uh, for the GLP. And the demand was so high that Canada closed its borders. And then, and just Dr. Taylor's point, those patients that were taking the medicine from Canada had to completely stop it because in the US, it, they were, being charged $1,500 per month. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry, between $800 to $1,500 per month for the medicines, as opposed to for Canada, they were getting it from $280 with shipping. So yes, that was, it was not, the side effects I've had, like I said, I had just, I even counted just three patients, two of them had pancreatitis, both of them also had diabetes and they were more, you know, they had severe obesity. And one of them uh, started having significant hypoglycemia uh, with, with just going up from 0.25 to 0.5. So we brought him down to 0.25 and then added SGLT and then his weight kind of came down and he's doing fine. But again, it's all anecdotal. I wish I, I, I I'm not collecting numbers yet. I mean, uh, which we could do for the next talk if we have one. <laughs> No, I appreciate those comments. And it was more from the, the pre-meeting and the materials that were discussed today, um, saying that 70% of patients discontinued GLP at 24 months. That just seemed like a very alarming number um, that was reported. So that's um, that was some of the basis for my question um, today. So thank you. Again, I think some of that is is contaminated by older GLP drugs. But also, I just haven't seen that anywhere close to that. Even in the diabetes space, forgetting about weight, I, I just don't see those kind of numbers. But, you know, and I don't think my colleagues do either. We've talked about it before. Great. Thank I, you. I, I did read that, uh, the article that was sent. And in that particular, they were, the focus was completely on obesity patients. They didn't have diabetes. They excluded all patients with diabetes. It was just but it was still a very interesting 71%. I was like, okay, where is that number coming from? Because it said from Jan 1st to December 1st of 2021. And I'm like, okay. So there is there are some biases in the data itself. I feel like, you know, we need sure. to look into a little more. This is Emily Trance. I just want to call out another comment in the chat from, from Janet Stafta that's not a, not a question, but calling out that there are places where people are able to exercise safely and, and um, have access to healthy food, mm -hmm. and there are others where they where they aren't. And I, I think that's gotten discussed here some today, but, but I just wanted to make sure that that comment was called out and acknowledged, and, and I think it's very much, you know, this, the medications are one piece of the picture if there are there are a lot of other, a lot of other pieces and a lot of work that needs to go into this. And there's disparities in both pieces, right? I mean, and that's the key thing, right? Yes, there are safe places, but a lot of people don't have access. And yes, there are healthier foods, but a lot of people can't afford them. And yes, there are effective medicines and a lot of people don't have access to them. So, and unfortunately it's a lot of the same people for those three things, so.
And Janice, I see that you saw your hand up for a second. Did you want to? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to add because somebody made a comment in this country, we're lucky. And, you know, it's sad because, I mean, we know that individuals that come here from, you know, say South America, Mexico, and are working in the sec, you know, by the, after they've been here 20, 30 years, they develop these diseases we're talking about, but the people back home, they don't, right? So, you know, the, you know, we have these really serious disparities here, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Thaler, that it tends to be some of the same people, right? But yeah, it's, you know, we can make assumptions, but truthfully, in other countries, we do have, I think what we do have here is treatments like the GLP or, you know, here in this country that are available. I wanted to ask one question. You mentioned about uh, somebody on Medicaid say that was, you know, BMI 50 and electric chair, but they couldn't get um, the GLP. Is that because they don't have diabetes it, or why? Is that why? Well, on Medicaid, it's hard to get Ozempic covered even for diabetes. So mm. on Medicaid, so Victoza, which is liraglutide, which, which is, I guess you would say GLP 2.0. So 1.0 was Bieta or Xenotide, which is a long time ago now, which really no one uses anymore. Liraglutide is the daily GLP and was really the first to show a lot of efficacy. It also shows better cardiovascular outcomes. Like it's a good drug. And that one now it's been long enough and is now close to generic or almost it is generic essentially, but it's not available yet from any company. That one you can get relatively easily even for Medicaid nowadays, but the, the newer generation, so Trulicity, which hasn't been mentioned, which is dilaglutide and semaglutide, Ozempic are still, there are still barriers to that, even in diabetics. In non-diabetics, only um, liraglutide, which is marketed under Saxenda and semaglutide marketed under Wegovi, that they are just excluded. Medicaid patients don't have any weight coverage. So they're, they're excluded anyway. And in fact, even bariatric surgery, they're excluded from in the state of Washington, unless they have diabetes or as was mentioned, need a joint replacement. Those are the only two comorbid criteria that are allowed for patients on Medicaid to move forward to bariatric surgery. So that's still pretty restrictive. Um, not cardiovascular disease, not a bunch of other things. So uh, yeah, so the BMI 50 patient in a wheelchair with comorbidities, maybe not diabetes, but let's say heart failure or something else, they they don't qualify for this med any more than a person with a BMI of 30 who doesn't have those comorbidities. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. This has been very informative, by the way. I, I and I can on, tell you, yeah. Yeah. I served in the American College of Physicians clinical guidelines uh, mm -hmm. panel where we developed the A1C guidelines in 219. We're currently working on updating, currently looking at some of these medications. So I'm not sure it'll come out in the next year. So I appreciate learning more, but much of what I heard here, I've heard there as well. Thank you. Of course. Well, we've kind of sort of move from the panel into our structure and discussion space. Um, naturally, great, great questions, great questions and answers. And I appreciate our three panelists sticking around and kind of extending that um, portion. We have about 13 minutes left. And so I wanted to pause to see if there are other questions from folks who maybe haven't asked yet or other comments from folks that you haven't had an opportunity to say. Right, not hearing any. Are there any other questions or comments? Folks either in the room or on the phone slash computer? I, act I actually have one more. Um, I'm curious. So, you know, I've heard about a lot of the adverse events and gastroparesis and um, you know, others. And so, you know, if people have, uh, have had gastroparesis in the past, I guess, it, I think it's most often found after, uh, 
after having anesthesia. Is that correct? I mean, it does happen other times. But if you know that, would you prescribe it to people if they have a history of uh, digestive disorders overall, I guess, is better? I'm curious what the providers think. I don't think so. I don't think I would. Uh, uh, if they have, if, especially if they have diabetes and gastroparesis, I don't think it's a good choice. Um, but there are other choices. I mean, just because GLP is not covered, like we said, you know, there's so many other things that they can do. Um, so we would kind of switch to something else at that time. Thank you. Yeah, it depends on the degree, of course. I mean, some people have very mild gastroparesis and you might give it a try, but if they start to have side effects then you'd stop. But somebody with severe gastroparesis with like hospitalizations with vomiting or couldn't tolerate orals or that sort of thing, you can't use these meds. So, and that's pretty clear in the drug labeling. I mean, that the medication labeling is pretty clear on that. And, and I think most providers follow that. I think the one thing we have not talked about is semaglutide that is compounded, right? No, right. That's, that's like a big deal now. Uh, I get five phone calls from patients asking for that. Just I, the, the point I want to make is everybody wants to be on this medicine and everybody wants to give it a try. Uh, there's a big demand and it's a relatively safe medicine. So, and and they are, they are taking a, a, a big amount of risk going on compounding pharmacies, which is not FDA. I mean, I guess technically they found a loophole that you know FDA says that when drugs are in short supply that you can compound it and they're using that loophole to sell these medications and pay, patients are paying out of pocket. Mm -hmm. They're willing to pay up to $300, more than that they can't afford. Uh, so if the pharmacies are listening, they need to bring the cost down for us. Not Petra. Petra. There you go. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, recently saw, I think it was, I, I want to say it was on Medscape, um, a report that was talking about problems with people getting good clearance when they're doing bowel preps for mm. colonoscopy and speculating basically, or suggesting the possibility that when a person has, you know, is on one of these medications, they're more likely to need repeat colonoscopies uh, more frequently due to inadequate cleansing um, and inadequate prep prior to. I'm curious um, to hear from, from the doctors who have clinical experience with these, are you seeing anything like that? I know that's anecdotal too, but I'm curious. I have not, but I know that anesthesiology came out with a newspaper about patients that are on GLP before anesthesia. If they're taking Wegovy, they need to stop at least one week before going under. And if they're taking um, daily injections, they still need to stop a week before. And the reason being because the gastric emptying is slow. So when they are intubated, the, the question of aspiration. This is completely, I don't think there's any study. I don't think there's been any reported cases that that's happening. They are just being proactive and that's kind of where they put the newspaper and we are all kind of following that. But I don't think I've heard of any uh, real mishaps in that field. Dr. Thayer, yeah. am I right on there's that? Been some, there've been some reported cases. Okay. Yeah. You know, of, uh, observed <laughs> GI content when they've gone through the normal non wagovi back bowel prep. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know about s studies, but it's just, I think. Slowly. Yeah, the, I know I've seen, I, I've actually seen some anecdotal reports around the, the yes. anesthesia mm -hmm. concern. Yeah. Uh, it was the, the colonoscopy one was a new one for me. So I was, that's yeah. why I was curious about it. Yeah, they were recommending an ultrasound for, in both situations to see if prep was adequate yeah and we follow that same rick i i yeah and i i'm aware of that and it's not surprising based on the motility issues but i think it's very it's very manageable by just telling people to stop for a week or two and 
you know, if it's liraglutide, stop, you know, that's a daily, so stop for a little while, um, or for the weeklies, stop one or two doses before. So I, I don't, I don't think that's a major problem, but yeah, it's something that's newly reported. I haven't heard of anyone having to do a repeat, but we usually tell people to stop. Yeah, the, the report that I saw about the about the colonoscopies, they were talking about the person not having to have a repeat colonoscopy right away, but instead of being told, you know, come back in five years or come back in 10 years, they were being told to come back like in two or three years or even just one year uh, because they had gotten such a poor bowel prep. I realized there's a lot more going on when, when you're doing a bowel prep and what, what will or will not make it an adequate one. But uh, the author of the report I was reading was actually somewhat suggesting that people they should just extend the length of time that people do bowel preps and i just can't see people doing that no um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. i think we have a comment from the room yeah so it is interesting to me that these drugs have been around for nearly 20 years and we're just hearing of these sort of side effects and i i wonder if it's the popularity or if it's mm -hmm. the obesity bias or what's contributing and i and i do think it is an issue with anesthesia and with colonoscopy prep it certainly can be but I wonder how much that's influenced by what these drugs are being used for now versus what they've been used for historically. Yeah, but that's kind of like what happened with COVID and COVID side effects is that we all of a sudden people learn a whole lot mm. of things really fast just because of the volume of cases, you know, mm. yeah. I mean, so this is a different volume of experience. Mm. And so, you know, like I, what I was reading before this is like there's a 1% approximately mm. uh, side effect rate, but when you've got X percent of the population engaged in the drug, that's, you know, the total number becomes much larger. So mm. I think it's just those things. It's yeah. just really how many people are yeah. taking. Speaking as a pharmacist I, I, with 30 plus years experience, yeah, I'll agree. Because yeah. that's what I've seen with a lot of drugs actually over the course of my career. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also, I, I think it's both. I think it is awareness too, right? There's, there's a hyper focus on these things yeah. now that there wasn't, but it is also just how many prescriptions have been written and how many people are on them. And the newer agents have a more profound effect on gastric motility than the older agents did, which is one of the reasons they're more effective probably, um, particularly for diabetes, probably more so than for weight. But um, so I think it's a combo of all of those things. And then with diabetes, there is gastric already. Yeah. Until, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if it was just in that population, what would you be blaming exactly? Mm -hmm. um, All right. We've got about five minutes left. Any kind of final comments before we close? I wanted to bring up, so I did, like I said, survey some of my colleagues at the Diabetes Institute, which is much more of a sort of private payer scenario, um, kind of world, you know, high level diabetes care, as well as some uh, patients with not diabetes and, and with weight. And, and one of the things that came up, because one of the questions that wasn't discussed was sort of what systemic changes would we like to see in that kind of thing. And, and one that was brought up was this idea of some kind of built in prior off accessible system within our electronic health records, which we don't really have, um, at least in our scenario, sort of like a cover my meds, but much more built in to the system so that you don't go through, because what often happens is you have these long conversations, then you try to write the prescription, then you go through this long hassle prior authorization process that doesn't start right away, that has uncertain, you know, it goes through this sort of labyrinth and eventually comes out or doesn't, and there's long delays in care and there's, it, it just creates barriers for the doc as well as the patients in terms of prescribing these meds. And it's very inefficient and, and, could be managed electronically with you know current systems it's just strange sure. that that isn't all integrated already mm -hmm. so that was one point that was brought up that's good yeah. good way to end it too dr Tim, same other what would you like to see changed i would like one common app for prior authorization i'm doing apps for my son college apps i'm like if colleges can do it I know medicine, we can do it. We can make one single thing that we send to all, all pharmacy, all insurance companies, and that should just sell. That would be my wish. Okay. I love it.
All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you to everybody who has joined us today and much appreciated. Well, thanks for convening. And it, it's an important, mm -hmm. I, and it's a different kind of convening for Brie to have a topical discussion in real time rather than to study something for a year. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's important that we had input from this point in time. So thank you for doing that. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, the event will also be, it was recorded, so it'll be posted on our website, and um, you can contact the freequalityhealth.org for feedback or anything else you'd like to share, share my screen here. Yeah. But thank you again to our panelists for participating um, and joining us in this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maude. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you all.